I believe it was the year 2008 that Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI declared the year of priests, the year of priests. Does anyone remember that? Some do. And he also declared that uh, St. John Vianney would be the patron saint of diocesan priests around the world. It was an opportunity to reflect on the priesthood and in a particular way for priests to uh, reflect on their call to priesthood and what that calls them to. And so uh, having heard that St. John Vianney is the patron saint of diocesan priests, I, I, I figured I'd better find out a little bit about this fellow. I didn't really know much about him. I knew his name, of course. And uh, so I bought a book and I read about his life. And he, uh, he was a, uh, an amazing man. And uh, some of the things I found out about him was that he, he struggled in becoming a priest. He, he uh, struggled in his studies. Now, back then, you needed to learn Latin. Today, that's not the case. But he struggled in his academic studies and, and learning Latin. And his, his ordination kept getting postponed and postponed. And uh, it, it took him 11 years to complete his studies and, and for the bishop to finally uh, ordain him. And uh, so uh, it took him a while uh, to become a priest. And after he became a priest, uh, the bishop assigned him to a little parish out in rural France by the name of Ars. And I think the thinking was that if we send this fellow out there, he probably won't cause too much damage, okay? So, and I've had the opportunity to go to Ars in France on one of the pilgrimages that I have been on. And, and there's the little church still there, his body is there, uh, the confessional where he heard confessions and so forth. So I was blessed to have been in ours. The other thing about St. John Vianney is once he got there, he realized that the village was uh, in serious need of evangelization, that many of the Catholics that were there, uh, obviously there, was a, a there were Catholics there because there was a parish, a church that many of them weren't practicing their faith. They weren't practicing the faith. They weren't honoring the Sabbath. They weren't living as God called them to live according to their baptism. And many other people in the village didn't even know about God and his love for them and the salvation that Jesus Christ offers them. So what did he do? He began to pray. He began to intercede. He spent hours before the Blessed Sacrament. He prayed the rosary. He fasted. He uh, then began to go into the confessional and just be there. And guess what happened? The Holy Spirit began to work. And one by one, people returned to the faith. They, they came to the sacrament of reconciliation, confessed their sins, and began to practice the faith. And before long, the whole village pretty much was back living the faith. Now, that's what our evangelical brothers and sisters call a revival. We don't commonly use that word in the Catholic Church. But it's a good word. And a revival is when the gospel impacts a particular community, village, nation, country in such a profound way that everything about the way people live their lives changes and they begin, their lives begin to reflect how the gospel calls them to live. His fame began to spread and people from all over began to see this holy priest. And by the time he died, they actually built a train a train track from Paris to ours to transit all the people that were coming. Some 80,000 people a year were coming to ours to see this priest and to have him hear their confession. Now, I would say that that's a man who impacted the world for the gospel. Would you agree with that? Yes. Amen. Now, I'm not in any way comparing my life to St. John Vianney in that way. When I read about his life, what I identified with was he was out in a little rural parish. And at that time, I was in a rural parish in Eastern Passage, or Eastern Nova Scotia, what we call the Eastern Shore. I uh, had two churches, St. Je St. Genevieve in East Cheswick and St. Philip Neary in Muscatawit Harbor. And where I identify was, okay, I'm out here in this little parish, this little, little rural area, and, and here I am for, for however long I will be. So, so maybe I, like John Vianney, can have some little impact while I'm here for the Lord, for the kingdom of God, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Secondly, I found out that his baptism or his memorial was August the 4th, today. And I realized that I was baptized on his memorial 
I was baptized on August the 4th at Immaculate Conception Church in St. John, New Brunswick. And so th for those two reasons, I, from that day forward, have identified with St. John Vianney. Today, let's ask for his intercession in a particular way as the Word of God is preached, as we pray together, as we receive the Holy Eucharist. Like John Vianney, I believe that when the Word of God is preached, and he talked about this all the time, that the word of God, when it is preached and hearts are open, that lives are changed and transformed. Every time we come to Mass, if we come with that expectation that God is going to move among us as we hear the word of God, as we pray together, receive the Eucharist, I firmly believe that none of us here today will leave the same way as we came in this morning when we leave after Mass. Do you believe that? How many believe that today? Okay. That's what's going to happen today. So what are the scriptures saying to us today? Well, when I've reflected on them, the, the, the first reading from Ecclesiastes and the Gospel, to me they speak to us about two profound truths. The first truth is this, that life, this life that we live here on earth, irregardless of what we accomplish, irregardless of how much success we have in this earthly life in terms of business, maybe what we accomplish in terms of sports, what we accomplish in terms of education or awards or what accolades may be given to us in this life, that if we do not know God, if we do not know God, as the author says, it is all vanity, it is all hard toil, and it is all for naught. That is the fundamental truth of the first reading. Jesus then expands on that in the gospel. He tells a story, what we call a parable, of a man who had acquired a lot in this life. As a matter of fact, he had so much abundance that he had to tear down his little barns and he had to build bigger barns to, uh, to accommodate all these goods. He, we have a word for someone like that called a hoarder. He hoarded all his goods. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with having things in this life. However, we're not to be attached to them, and we are to use them, understanding that God has blessed us with them to advance the kingdom of God for the glory of God. So he had all kinds of barns with all kinds of goods. And the other thing that we would, to bring it to our modern day, we would say is this guy had a big, fat bank account. He also had probably what we would call today a big fat RRSP. If you're visiting from the United States, he had a big fat 401k account. <laughs> now here's the problem. I'm not suggesting that we don't have our RRSP or 401k accounts, so don't go away saying Father Mark said don't invest in RRSPs. <laughs> here's what I am saying. This led him to what we would call a false sense of security. He was putting his trust in his goods that he had acquired. He had a false sense of security. And he said to himself, he said, soul, that's speaking to himself, I have all these goods, so now I'm just going to sit back and it's just going to be a wonderful life. I will just enjoy my retirement for the next 20, 30, 40 years, whatever. But there was a problem with that. And Jesus speaks to that. He said, tonight, your life will be demanded of you. None of us know when the Lord our God will call us from this life to the next. He doesn't give us that information in advance. And every day we hear of people who are called very suddenly into eternity. And the implication in the gospel is that this man was not ready. He was not ready to meet the Lord God Almighty and to give an account of his life, that he had not used his goods. That's the implication in serving God and glorifying God and helping others. That's the implication in the gospel today. And for that reason, Jesus calls, or he says, God said to that man, you are a fool. And so that's the powerful truths in the, in the scriptures today, that if we do not come to know God, if we not, do not come to love God and to serve God, whatever we may acquire in this life will be for nothing. It will be for vanity's sake. Jesus does not mince words. 
He speaks very clearly in the Gospels, and he does it fairly often. He speaks very clearly and plainly and does not mince words when he speaks about the two possible eternal destinies for human beings when our earthly life is over. He says there are only two possible destinies when we depart from this life. One is heaven. One is heaven for all eternity with the blessed trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Virgin Mary, the angels, and all the saints. That's one possibility, and it's going to be absolutely glorious. The scripture says that it has not entered into the heart of man and woman what God has prepared for those who love him. It's going to be beyond anything that we can possibly imagine. The second possible destination is a place that Jesus calls hell. And the church has constantly affirmed the existence of that place. And I wrote down the articles. You probably won't remember them. But if you have a Catholic catechism, just go into the index and look up heaven, because there's articles that pertain to heaven and articles that pertain to hell. But here's what it says pertaining to hell. It says this, we cannot be united with God unless we freely choose to love him, but we cannot love God if we sin gravely against him, our neighbor and ourselves. To die in a state of mortal sin without repenting and accepting God's merciful love means remaining separated from him forever by our own free choice. This state of self-exclusion from communion with God and the blessed is called hell. Now, like St. John Vianney, he said this, I would much rather speak about the glories of heaven than the evil of vice in hell. But from time to time, we must hold out this reality because Dr. Ralph Martin, and I know some of you know who Dr. Ralph Martin is, a very well-known Catholic layperson. He wrote a book called Are Many Saved? And he said this, we really can't fully appreciate how good the good news is until we understand how bad the bad news is. Does that make sense? And so I want to very clearly today, in love, have us all understand those two possible destinies and know clearly that those, this is the choice that is before us. Now I want to share the real good news with you. None of us here today have to spend eternity separated from God. Amen? Amen. He sent his son, Jesus Christ. He became a man like us. He experienced everything that we experience in life, all the emotions, the full range of emotions, joy, sorrow, happiness, suffering like we do, suffering beyond what any of us will ever experience. And he did all that to show us the love of God, the love of our Heavenly Father, our good Abba Father, so that we could have our sins forgiven and we all need forgiveness and be called into the family of God and become one of his children, a son or a daughter of the living God. The scripture calls those who have responded to that invitation of salvation, beloved, beloved sons and daughters, beloved children of the Father. And so that's the good news. Now, I never know who's going to be here. And maybe there's some here today. You're hearing that explained in a very clear and simple way because I'm a very simple guy. And you're maybe hearing this for the first time, that God loves you. And he calls you into relationship with himself through his son, Jesus Christ, so that you can become his son or daughter. I have brought some of these little brochures. This is actually written by a companion of the cross, Father Simon Lobo. It's probably one of the best things I've come across that clearly, simply, in a little more detail, explains that call and how you can have that personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And then what to do after that. And there's a little prayer you can even pray, inviting the Lord into your heart. And so I have a few, few of these out here on the table. I invite you to take one if you feel led 
as you leave today. You see, the only rational choice for any of us to make here today when we hear this good news that God loves us personally and wants a relationship with us, the only rational choice is to turn to God, to turn to his son, Jesus Christ, with our whole heart and our whole mind. Because that's what repentance means. Repentance means to have a change of heart, turn from the way that we're living our lives, going this way, and turn around 180 degrees, turn to God, follow him, and live where he, uh, the way he calls us to live. And I firmly believe that all of us here today, God has ordained that we were here today to hear this good news, to hear this good news. God has a plan for your life. Before the foundation of the world, he knew that you were going to come into existence. And he has prepared things for you to do, the scripture says, in Jesus Christ, that only you can do. And if you will respond to this invitation of this great salvation, then God will begin to unfold his good plan for your life. Jeremiah 29, verse 11 says, The Lord says, I know the plans I have for you, a plan for good, not for evil, a plan for a future, a future full of hope. The author of the book of Hebrews says this, chapter 2, verse 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? I believe for all of us here today, the Lord is also reminding us. For those of you who have responded to that call and are following the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe the Lord has called you here today, and I include myself in this, to remind us of how great the gift of salvation is that we have received so that we can be in re reinvigorated by the Holy Spirit to, to press on, because it's not easy to be a Christian today, to press on and to serve the Lord in gladness and to fulfill God's plan, that individual plan that he has for each of us each day as we seek him in prayer. And if you're listening today, on live stream. Now, this is the first time I've ever preached, and I'm on live stream. But if you're listening on live stream today, God has ordained that you have heard this message of good news. So I want to I conclude today. I always like to leave some questions for people to reflect on. So the first question is simply this. Because, again, I don't know who's listening, and I don't know who is here today. Do you know Jesus Christ personally? Have you opened your heart to him and made a conscious decision to follow him, asking him into your heart? And if you were baptized as an infant, have you answered that baptismal call to become a disciple of Christ? So that's the quest first question. Do you know Jesus Christ? Secondly, if you're following Jesus, we can, we can reflect from time to time, are we really rich towards God? Are we using whatever he has blessed us with our time and our talent and our treasure to build up the kingdom of God, to be a witness in some way to someone else about the fact that God loves them and calls them into relationship with him. Thirdly, are we in the spiritual battle? We must understand that we are in a spiritual battle. There's only two kingdoms, the kingdom of darkness. Satan is the head of that, the kingdom of light and love. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the head of that. And we're either in one of those two kingdoms. There is no neutral kingdom. And so we are called to enter that spiritual battle, which is to intercede for others that they might come to know Jesus Christ as we have. That means we pray in some way. And I, and I don't get into saying people have to pray in a particular way. Some may have a very strong devotional life, the rosary, divine mercy chaplet, novenas, other formal prayers. Others may just like to pray and talk to the Lord, Lord the way I'm talking to you today, and that's perfectly okay. But in some way, every day we should be interceding for souls to come to know God's love and our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I leave you with those three questions to ponder the greatness of the salvation, the greatness of God's love that he offers to all of us in Jesus Christ. Amen.